author of 22 books, the latest of which is Hail, Hail, Euphoria, presenting the Marx Brothers in Duck Soup, the greatest war movie ever made, Mr. Roy Blunt, Jr. Roy, welcome to Key West. Good to be here, Kerry. Good to have you. Good to have you back in town. You've been here before for the literary seminar, and it's yeah. always a, a pleasure to have you folks in town. Roy, uh, this book is, is, is a great, great read, and, and I, I kind of wanted you to maybe explain the title to folks. Uh, it's, a, it's a long title. And maybe uh, maybe you could explain to them uh, and get them in the mood of mood of duck soup. Hail hail euphoria! I'm trying to remember what the title is. <laughs> it's, long, it's long. It's long. It's long. Hail hail euphoria! <laughs> presenting the Marx Brothers in Duck Soup, the greatest war movie ever made. Um, it um, the reason we call it the greatest war movie ever made is that Mili Military History Magazine called it the 24th greatest war movie ever made, and as you can see, we don't have room <laughs> for the 24th, so we call it the greatest war movie ever made. Why not? And Duck Soup is the title of the movie. It was made in 1933 at the depths of the Depression, and it is just a completely crazy movie, not about, uh, you know, it has no justification at all, except just sort of hilarity. Right. And well, the Marx Brothers are in it, that's why that, and hail, hail, you the big song in it is Hail, Hail, Fredonia, Land of the Brave <laughs> and Free. It's, it, uh, it's, it, there's no doubt it's a great movie, but, but Roy, you've written about so many different topics. How does it come to you that you're going to write a book about duck soup? Well, every book is different, but in this case, um, a, an editor at uh, HarperCollins uh, started, was starting a series of books of one writer writing about one thing that the writer wanted to write about. And he said, would you like to write a short book about something? And I always wanted to write a book about a movie, and I've always been interested in the Leo McCary, the director of this movie. Right. never gotten enough credit for having written uh, lots of different kinds of funny movies, comedy not all comedy books. Anyway, that, that's, that's the great thing about this book. I mean, it's a great romp through the movie, but there's a lot of historical information, too, in here. I mean, it must have taken a, quite a while to research all that. Well, it took a while, yeah, but it was fun, you know, watching old movies. And, um, uh, and then I, when I was writing it, I had my own big monitor on my desktop computer, and I could put the watch the movie up in one corner and, and write on the rest of the screen and uh, start it and stop it and back it that's, up and that's, that's uh, examine it in detail. That's pretty, that's pretty fancy, yeah. Well, you explore all the Marxes in great detail, and, and I have to give you some credit. I, I, don't, I, I don't know this to be true for a fact, but I, I gotta think you're the only person that's ever written a book about the Marx Brothers and found a way to work Karl Marx into the whole thing. Yeah, book. well, but, you know. But it, there Karl is, about page 73, and I'm like, oh, well, he, now I had to, make, had to read closely to make sure he wasn't one of the brothers, that's actually. That's right, well, he had more, uh, he was actually funnier, I found out, <laughs> than he had as a reputation for. Well, you, I mean, did you come away having, uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe the way way to say it is a favorite, but I mean having having a lot of having more respect or thinking one of the brothers is maybe the most influential or well the nicest one certainly the one that everybody liked and the happiest one was Harpo. Uh, he's he um, wound up uh, he never got married for a long time, but then he, when he did get married, he stayed married, had a happy marriage, and adopted four children and uh, had, and played with the children all the time, and uh, everybody loved. Harpo, who on screen is the craziest of them, which is saying a great deal, but uh, in real life, even though he was sort of crazy, uh, he was also lovable and uh, turned out to know how to live. Yeah, well it's funny how they all evolved. I guess, you know, uh, Harpo, I guess one time they didn't have any lines for him, so he just decided he wasn't going to talk anymore. Yeah, well, he, he so he decided he would ad-lib, and the ad-libs didn't go over. Right, so he right. Said, well, I'm not say anything for the rest of his career. He, that was in vaudeville, that he, uh, tried to ad lib, but he never spoke again in the act, and uh, right. so people think he can't, couldn't speak, but he, in real life, he could, and he, he had a sort of George, uh, Georgia, he had a sort of New York accent from growing up on the streets of New York. And, and Groucho, I guess, one, you know, he used to actually wear a mustache, but then, uh, I guess, didn't have it one time and put on grease paint and said, well, why, why fool with the other? Yeah, right, he just, he was late to the uh, vaudeville performance and just smeared on some grease paint, and it went well, and uh, until he went on TV, he uh, didn't, finally on TV, you know, it wasn't high right. depth, but <laughs> right. it was, uh, right. I right. guess, a smear of grease paint doesn't really work on TV, so he grew his own. All right. Okay. And, and one, th one thing, and this is very important, I mean, you point out early in the book that it, it is, in fact, Chico versus Chico. That's right. It, yeah, they call him Chico because he chased chicks. <laughs> and he did chase them to a fault. He, Suc successfully, uh, too. <laughs> he caught them. Right? He caught a number of them, apparently, and uh, which uh, hurt his wife's feelings a great deal and <laughs> ruined his marriage eventually. She was a long-suffering person. But everybody loved Chico, but he just behaved. He was a 
degenerate gambler at the age of 11, <laughs> and from then on, and he loved to lose money. He loved to lose bets. He would bet on anything. And they made a movie called, uh, which one was it? It was uh, Horse Feathers, where there was a football game in the movie, and he would bet with the crew on who was going to win the football game, even though it was scripted. Who was going to win. He just, had, had he just couldn't help himself. Yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe the next take. They win. <laughs> well, the interesting thing you wrote about Chico is, I guess he he kind of figured out early on that there was just so much personality going on with Harpo, with Harpo and Groucho that he was just going to have to back away. I think you said in the book that, that there was just not room for all three of them in that, all, at that level. So. All three of them to be prima donnas. Yeah. He, her, his wife tried to talk him into yeah. being more assertive and uh, being, because Groucho and Harpo tended to be regarded as the stars, even though Chico was the o oldest brother and the dominant brother, the alpha brother in the family. Mm -hmm. And he, whenever they got in trouble, Chico was always in trouble. Well, whenever the whole group got in trouble, Chico would pull something off and wangle a contract <laughs> or, or win a big gin game or something and get them back in action. So and Chico I, was, a, was a strong personality, but he, he figured let, let the other guys be strong in the movie. I think that kind of happened to Larry in the Three Stooges. You know, I always felt kind of <laughs> bad for Larry because, you know, here's your big old uh, yeah, uh, Curly, curly and, and your, your Mo, your Mo and, and, yeah, right. you know, and Mo would poke Curly in there and he'd poke Larry just for standing there. I know, so, right. But I guess in the end, you all make the same money, so it doesn't make any difference. But yeah. But uh, it's quite a wrong. And the other thing I can't believe is that they actually did this live on stage back in vaudeville. They were, yeah. doing, they were doing like coconuts, like the whole movies right. on stage. Yeah, they, um, yeah, on the Broadway stage they did um, uh, most, not this movie, not Duck Soup, right, but right. Coconuts and a couple of others they worked out on stage. And so by the time they got, got it filmed, and they, were, they tended to think, at least in the early days, in terms of the stage too, they would, they couldn't stay on camera. They, uh, they were moving around they, too much. Yeah, they were used to just going wherever they wanted to within the, uh, the set. But then, so there was a point, one point they had one cameraman for each brother and just so they'd get a shot of each of them somehow or another. And it turned out that all three cameras got focused on Harpo. <laughs> uh, just had, just had to do the whole thing. Over. It was like herding cats. You can't yeah. keep up. Yeah. Well, I, I, can't, I can't believe somebody didn't get hurt every night with these guys running around stage like that. But um, well, it's a great book. I, wanna, I wanted to talk about one other uh, series of books that you did with the photographer Valerie Schaff. Yeah. Uh, these are great. And, and uh, Valerie takes pictures of the, these great animals, puppies, puppies cats, dogs, pigs. And Roy uh, sort of is, is, the, is the animal whisperer and kind of interprets what their expressions uh, seem to imply. But this had to be a lot of fun. It was. Uh, Valerie has a great knack for making eye contact with dogs, and we did cats, and we did barnyard animals. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so then I would just get the pictures and imagine what the dog was thinking. Well, it, I, you know, it, it, like I said, you, you, you are a whisperer because as soon as you write about it, it becomes clear to me that that's exactly what the dog must be thinking. I don't know how you did, how'd you do with pigs, pretty good? Yeah, pigs are not bad. Pigs are smart. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, growing up, we would, of course, put words in the mouth of our pets. You know, right, right. Yeah. Snoopy says, well, I had a dog named Snoopy back before Peanuts. And, well, Snoopy says he'd like a little, uh, you know, a little bit of that ham, wouldn't you, Snoopy? <laughs> <laughs> so I had practice all my life. Uh, well, actually, it's funny. I wanted, to, I wanted to come back and ask you a, at least one food question. Uh, you know, you've been down talking about food at the QS Literary mm -hmm. Seminar. And you and I both grew up in the South, and I'm sure we, we saw a lot of the same food. Uh, yeah. what, what's your take on okra? I love okra. Um, Do you really? Yeah, I love it boiled or fried. Either crisp or slick inside. Yeah. I even wrote a poem about okra. I don't remember the whole thing, but I grew up eating okra. I probably when I was a little kid, I didn't like it, but I certainly like. I fry it and eat it now. Yeah. I even boil it, and eat it now. So I, it's it's got kind a of little pepper sauce on it, a little hmm. vinegar. It's great. I never came around to the boiled okra, but did, 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 a little family. southern fact. You know, okra is related to cotton. I'm, you know, I actually do know that. Do yeah, know if that. you have, well, for those of you who don't know, oddly enough, it doesn't look like it's oddly enough because cotton is so uh, unslick. <laughs> it is, but if you plant your okra too close to your cotton, it'll ruin your cotton. Oh, I didn't know that. It's yeah, kind of green it makes it stringy or something, <laughs> so they'll cross pollinate. So just in case, uh, any, in case that helps anybody out there, you know, it's always it. good to know yeah. that. But, uh, um, well, Roy, I, I, I hope you enjoy your time in Key West. What, what are you working on now? I have a book coming out in May uh, called Alpha Better Juice. I have a book called Alpha Bet Juice that came out in uh, last year, two years ago, and uh, the next one is Alpha Better Juice. It's all about words and. Uh, letters and uh, the sounds of words and why the sounds of words are important. 
Well, you, I, I think that's a, you're definitely qualified in that topic. Well, thank you. I, well, I did want to mention one other thing, though. Uh, your your book about the Pittsburgh Steelers, I'm not sure. Was that your first book? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. I, I was uh, working at Sports Illustrated. But I, that's still regarded as one of, the, one of the best sports books ever written. Did, did, you, did you think when you started out maybe you'd be writing about sports? Uh, well, I, I uh, wrote about sports some in high school, you know, uh -huh. for the local paper, and then I won a scholarship to Vanderbilt, the Grantland Rice Sports Writing Scholarship. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Which was a wonderful scholarship back then. It was a four-year full ride. Wow, that's great. great. That's great. And so I had that background, and I liked sports, and but I was working for the Atlanta Journal writing about politics and stuff, and uh, then but a friend of mine who had a job at Sports Illustrated mm -hmm. said they were looking for somebody they could hire cheap, and I wanted to good up to New York so <laughs> well yeah I, I think that's a good choice well the the book is hail hail euphoria presenting the Marx Brothers in duck soup the greatest war movie ever made mr. Roy Blunt jr. thank you so much for being with us we'll see you next time here in Key West. Good, thank you.